by yourself. Yeah. That's all right, I'll talk to myself. I do often anyway. Uh, just a heads up, here's my, here's my disclaimer for next week. Just so you know. Next week we are going to be going back to the Old Testament. We're going to be in first Ezekiel, then we're going to follow up with Daniel. So we have, if you've noticed that there's a kind of a consistent end times theme, there is. I'm doing it on purpose. Primarily because I haven't talked anything about it since I've been here. I've been here for four years. I think it's time maybe I should hit that too. I uh, know I there's a there's a reason it's taken me four years to get there. Primarily because it is a very attractive thing for young pastors to preach about because it's exciting. It's, it's sexy. So it's like everybody likes to go see a disaster movie. So they want it. To, so there's a there's a gravitational pull that hit those kind of books. So, uh, but I I dig my heels firmly and try to only hit it about as much as it needs to be. So part of the reason we did Second Thessalonians is to frame our thought. So yes, there is going to be a time that history closes. Yes, there's truth to it. Yes, we can have doctrine all surrounding uh, what are our belief on how the how the days are going to roll out, how the closing of things are going to roll out. However. Does it forgive us from doing the Great Commission? No. So, if, let's say history ends with the last seven years uh, as a tribulation period, during those seven years, do we still do the Great Commission? Okay. If it might risk our life, do we still do the Great Commission? Okay. It is risk, it, at, the li at the risk of people's lives, people have given them the message, the good news of the gospel, uh, throughout time, so it won't change even if there is an antichrist in charge of everything. By the way. So, we will talk about it. Now here's my other disclaimer about where we're going to. Because we're going to be talking kind of in this, there's a lot of figurative and spiritual kind of language in both Daniel and Ezekiel. And it is not something that I am naturally comfortable in thinking like that way, that whole worldview. I come from a very practical, very modern, very post-enlightened worldview. So if I am going to see a cause, I am going to think the cause is a natural cause, not a supernatural cause. So I, th I think if somebody is cold, give them a blanket, it'll make them warm. And I leave it at that. So I see everything is kind of in the material plane. However, the reason some people are cold is because there's sometimes happening, the cause is on a supernatural level. That that may have created some sort of imbalance or un inadequacy or, or, or some sort of victimization. That me just solving the symptom isn't my whole reason for being. That a lot of times, what I'm looking down here as as the problems that I'm dealing with are merely the symptoms of a spiritual truth. So as I come back and look, so we could say whatever, I'll, I'll mention politics. We could say the, the problem is that there's a political power that I disagree with here. What I forget is that there's a supernatural thing underneath it. And if I'm aiming at the wrong thing, I'm not solving it. It's kind of like somebody that's sick and all they're doing is medicating the symptoms. Now why that's an issue is that when we roll here to Thessalonians, and as we've been rolling in Thessalonians, Thessalonians has been talking to the, the believers to get their eyes and their mission right. Because where we are supposed to be targeting is we're supposed to be targeting, targeting the supernatural forces behind all of this. We spend way too much time with our eyes too low combating the, the symptoms and not the causes. Does that make sense? That's what we're looking at. So last week, we, uh, we, were, we really kind of hit on the fact that we are here uh, and we're kind of supposed to get at, at mission. And it, it dealt with the fact that there were a lot of uh, believers in the Thessalonian church, and here's my, I will say this, I'm going to conjugate that weirdly at some point today. Thess Thessalonica is the, is the place, Thessalonians is the conjugation. 
At some point, I'm going to say Thessalonikian, probably. <laughs> so just, just stand by. We'll let Webster know. We'll let Webster know. <laughs> so the Thessalonian church, uh, there were a lot of people that were scared because they thought the world was in. And so Paul, in last chapter, is dealing with the fear. First of all, he deals with it head on. And he says, listen, these are the things. But he also reshapes it. And he says, listen, and, you know, if, and, you know, I should say this. If you're listening to a preaching or a teaching that leaves you fearful when it comes to the end times, it is not of God. It's not of God. If, you're, if you leave a message and somehow you are afraid of the Antichrist, that is not of God. 2 Thessalonians is pretty clear. The Antichrist is supposed to be afraid of us. And we forget that. We forget that we're the, we're the big goodies. I don't know, to, to, use a, to use a superhero parallel. In the Old Testament, God's people were the sidekicks, if you will. So like what Daniel prays, the way that Daniel prays, in the Old Testament, the way Elijah put in praise in the Old Testament is not how believers in the New Testament pray. And I think we miss that. See, we think we're still the sidekicks. When you open up in, uh, in the Old Testament, you see Elijah. Elijah is a prophet of Yahweh. And who he battles against is the prophets of Baal, Right? So then the picture is Yahweh is proving his superiority to the spiritual power of Baal. So it's Yahweh versus Baal. That is how it works in the Old Testament. When Daniel is praying, he's praying and the, and the Archangel Michael is coming to do something. So he is praying, he's the sidekick. The Archangel Michael is, is facing opposition against the spiritual forces of Babylon. And the Archangel Michael is battling all of that. That is how it works in the Old Testament. That there are, because... The thrones of humanity are underneath the authority of the evil one, uh, underneath the authority of Satan, up until the crucifixion. Then all of that changes. The crucifixion changes all that. And we are no longer the sidekicks in the story. In the New Testament on, the holy ones that are, that are accomplishing God's, God's mission are not angels in the sense of a supernatural being apart from the church. It is the church. When we become believers in Christ and covered in his blood, we're empowered by his Holy Spirit. We are the biggies. We are no longer sidekicks. And that's the message moving forward. That's why it says, if you resist the devil, he will flee. We don't, we, we forget that. And we look at our world and we wring our hands and we, we wonder what I hope God comes back soon because I can't believe it. Folks, we're the ones that have the super weapon system that we have just got it, you know, covered in the back. We're, in some ways, we're hidden, and we're not doing our job because we're afraid. He dealt with that in chapter 2. Chapter 3, he deals with it. Sometimes we don't take our tank out for a walk. Don't let the tank go out for a walk because we're lazy. It hits on that too. Uh, so here we go. That's what he's going to say today. Uh, so 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he's going to say the church, and I say the church or, or Christian living or the kingdom, however you want to say it, being a believer, it's not a spectator sport. We get up and we go. That is our, our when it's go, it's all of us. So that's the idea. So if you open up to chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, uh, the first verse here, finally, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. Here it is. These great spiritual leaders are asking the church that they're working over to pray for them because you know what? Those are big spiritual guns. So back to the picture before. Before it was Elijah was battering the prophets of Baal and Yahweh was defeating Baal. After the crucifixion, we battle Baal for the prophets of Baal. Our goal is to battle Baal to save the prophets of Baal. That is how the New Testament rolls. Here he is, 
Paul is asking these believers, not because they're low on the food chain to do this. He's saying pray because it matters that they pray because they're big guns. Don't sheath your big guns. Fire those big guns of prayer and our support because this will happen. And then beyond that, you see this movement of the word. I don't know if you're picking up on it quite here, but let me just show you. The idea of the word is moving in and through there. The word went from Paul, went from them, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, no, Paul, Paul Silas, Timothy, who are, I, don't know, I forgot who was it in chapter 1. Paul, Timothy, Silas? No. Tom? Anyway, I'll say Paul, Timothy, Silas. It'll, it'll, somebody will check it for me, right? <laughs> chapter 1, Paul, Timothy, Silas. Who's yes. he saying? No, Paul, Timothy. Oh, yeah, Paul, Silas, Timothy. I Paul, Silas. <laughs> so here they are. These big guys, they're asking for because here's the deal. For the church, we're not stratified in a sense that there are important believers and non-important believers. We're all important. Very much like an army. A general can say, we're going to take that hill. His officers then have to say, hey, we're going to take that hill. And then all the way down to the lowest private, they have to say, hey, we're taking that hill and <coughs> the hill. That's what we're seeing here is the word is coming in, it's passing through, it's transforming, and it's moving through. He's mentioned it, he kind of hits it here, just as rapidly it goes wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. It came to you, and it goes through you. Um, remember, the whole chapter, or the whole beginning of this letter started out with uh, Paul talking to them about how while they were enduring suffering, they were doing so in Christ in such a way that, that their actions were spreading out. And that's the same picture. So the word comes in, transforms, and moves through. Uh, I love that song, Onward Christian Soldiers. Onward Christian. That's what it is. That's this idea that we're marching and we're taking hills from the enemy. Folks, you know, I, I want to say that we're winning the war, but that's wrong. We've already won. The war is won. We're just cleaning up the battlefield. And what we're doing is we're running around the battlefield, and before the whistle is blown, we're trying to save as many lives as we can. And the reason that God is, and i got to tell you, we get, we get Christians that get all worried and wrapped up, and they hope that Jesus comes tomorrow because they're afraid. We should want Jesus to tarry one more day. Because we should be thinking about our whoever it was that didn't make a decision for Christ today. We're like, you know what, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up fresh and we're going to see what we can do. And we should be always hoping for the person that's going to make a decision for Christ tomorrow. And we just keep doing that until, until he does show up. Uh, continue on. Pray, too, that uh, we will be rescued from wicked and evil people. Not everyone is a believer, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And that's the reality is that there's, and oh, I didn't change this word and I wanted to. I say real, real opportunities and there's real opposition and there's real risk. But when I thought about the word real risk, I said, you know what, that's not true. That's one word that I want to put quotes with. Because if the enemy takes your life, what happens? What did he take from you, Dave? Nothing. Oh, he did take all my <laughs> he take all your pain, you're right. You're suffering. Yep. All that stuff. Yes. So there's so uh, so uh, Dan uh, Karchek suggested maybe temporal. There's a temporal risk. And it's true. Following the gospel, there's some things that you might lose out on. Here. But nothing on the eternal that we lose for following Christ. As a matter of fact, I, I know I said it last, last week, I, except for all the pain and, and evil that has been thrust upon the world, I almost pity the evil one. Because no gain that he makes is sure for him. He can invest all his effort in some knucklehead. And then a knucklehead causes all sorts of drama. 80, 90, 100 years old, there they are on their deathbed. The last minute, right before some Christian comes in, swoops in, and says, You want to accept Jesus? The person says, Yes, and whoa! All for not. Worse still, he can dial in all of that effort, and he can dial all of that effort in to somebody to make him a killer of Christians and this is great. And then he does like then Jesus does one of those things where he throws a switch and suddenly Paul 
is no longer fighting on his side. He's now a warrior for Christ. Eternally. You know, I, we, when we look at this, yes, there's real risk, and, and we should pray, and we should do this. But rem and remember that the evil one is our enemy. But it, you know, if we're in the Word, and if we're praying, we're the big guns on the field. We are confident in the Lord that you are do, doing and will continue to do the things that we commanded you. May the Lord lead your heart into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. So if you're, I don't know if you're kind of seeing this, but it's the same picture. It's that inside, uh, the understanding comes in, the understanding changes the way we live. So now the way that we live comes around. The comfort, the comfort that's found in Jesus Christ, the peace that's found in Jesus Christ, is in doing Jesus Christ's will. And sometimes we do this thing where things get bad and we pull inside and we get afraid. That's not what we're talking about. In the military, we would say somebody, we'd, we'd notice somebody when they go in, internal, where like the elements get down on them and they just kind of bottle, bottle up and they just, everything's shutting down. Maybe when you're hiking, somebody can do the same thing. They're like hypothermic and they're just kind of turning into themselves. There's that, there's that, that risk or, or that sort of stuff. What this is saying is that what we need to do is go out and be active and do that. Part of it is this, the enemy wants to isolate us. He wants to tell you that you don't have any power to change your life. And that's only, that's only half true. There is a power to change your life, but it isn't your power. It's God's power. But he wants to tell you you're powerless. He wants to tell you you're worthless. You're alone. And if we get here and we recognize who we are, we get out of our fighting hole and we start moving forward, then what we see is brothers and sisters to our left and right moving forward in the line. That's when you know you're in the army. And that gives us that comfort. That's what he's doing. He's pulling us, not from, from inside out. We have people that'll, that'll say, you know, if only I want to just kind of sit down and just, just take a relax, uh, just, just kind of relax a little while. Or maybe if, if life's really beat them up, they're like, I just need to come in and kind of be a pew sitter for a little while. I just need to just be an intaker of ministry. The, the thing is, that's not how it works. You can pray for God's peace and just sit there and go, I hope God will give you peace. But the way God gives you peace is by getting out and getting involved, getting connected. Um, it works as a, it assumes as a believer that we are out there working. Working is assumed. And also, even in that order, when I say working is assumed, somebody might say, well, does that mean you have to do certain works in order to get to heaven? They would say, are you saying there's certain activities you have to do to get to heaven? No. But it is assumed that if you are, again, the understanding and the, the change in your life results in these outside. So it's an inside-out process, not an outside-in process. Uh, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition that they receive. Uh, sorry. Who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they receive from us. For you know uh, that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? That's a strong warning, too. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this letter where he's, he's kind of pointing things out, he's like, in Jesus' name, no pew setters. No pew setters. You're like, that's easy. We don't have pews, right? <laughs> now, I should put this disclaimer in. So... What I don't mean by saying that is that you are wrong for coming and sitting and spending an hour learning about Jesus. That might actually look like you're sitting in a pew. A pew sitter is assuming that the whole body of your Christianity is summed up in that one hour on Sunday. You can come in and sit in a pew for one hour. 
Fantastic. But when you get your butt out of that seat, get to work. And as a matter of fact, going forward, that is the important part of the, that's the mission, that's the front line of the mission, is you guys. You guys are the doors to the church. You take the doors to the church wherever you go, and you're doing the ministry. That's the front line of battle. That's where, our, the, that's where the dangerous guns are. I was reminded today, as I was coming in, uh, about a, a spiritual mentor of mine who owned a music store, Don Grant. And uh, he has since gone to be with the Lord. He was a strong believer. But it was funny, as I was thinking through things driving in today, I was finally untangling some of the business lessons he gave me in how to run a music store were not business lessons at all. Like, there were plenty of times where, because he was a strong Christian, that he would come up, and this is the strong, strong Christian time, and I'd be like, oh, Don was a mentor of mine in this way. And then I'd be, and then he taught me how to run a music store. If I wanted to run a music store, I could be successful by following Don's model. Well, I finally realized that some of the things that were over here, it's like, blue, right? hey, wait a second. <laughs> when, it's, when I'm saying that, when you go out and do ministry, listen, ministry can look a whole lot of different ways than just whatever happens Sunday. But you should be involved doing something, getting your hands dirty. Because that's how it is. I love, the, I love the, uh, the nature lesson that you see when you get a, a, a in order for, for water to be living water, it has to have not only water coming in, but water going out. There's no water going out, you become the salt in the sea, you become the great salt lake, and you become the dead sea. Minerals come in and it poisons the water. Because there's no outflow. It's the same with believers. Uh, we never accept, so this is coming back to the lesson he said. Uh, we never accepted uh, food from anyone without paying for it. For uh, sorry, we worked hard night or sorry, we worked hard. I want to sing a Beatles song. I see that. <laughs> All right, here we go. We worked hard day and night so that we would not be a burden to you. We certainly have the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command: those unwilling to work will not eat. There you go. You've got to be willing to work to eat. Wait, Paul says that? Paul says that. Now, this is one of those things where he takes a very practical illustration and says, hey, this is how it works out. Maybe we just call this an economic illustration, but it's pushing at a spiritual truth underneath it. He's saying, very practically, you guys didn't have to feed us. We were working hard enough to feed ourselves. But what he's saying is what we were working to show that working is important. Hey, that word is important where it says a unwillingness to work. That is in there. There is a word that is unwillingness that is included in there. Because you know what? There are times that you may be willing to work, but you may, may not be able to work. There is no problem with that. There may be a point in life where suddenly uh, God has seen fit to uh, allow that I will have maybe a stroke or something and be bedridden or, or be in a place where I cannot do things that I'd normally call ministry. And then I'm still here on this earth so that, believe it or not, God allows other people to practice their ministry on me. I may not enjoy that thing, but it's my willingness to want to help other people. Wanting to be involved is important. There may be things that the church is doing that you want to get involved with in a, in a physical way that you cannot, but you can pray. That is getting strongly involved. There are things in your, in, that your body may not be able to, look, to allow you to do, or your time schedule may not allow you to do, but your willingness to do it is important. What, is pro, what, what he's calling about is he says that there are some people that are unwilling to do things, in other words, they're sitting out of things, not getting involved, not because they're busy, not because they're, they're, they're unable physically, but because they're lazy. Christians can be lazy. 
If you don't want to work, you don't want to eat. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty strong one. Um, it's a very practical example, he, but he doesn't stop there. As a matter of fact, this is a really strong warning he gives about laziness. He says, yet we, were here, we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work, and meddling in other people's business. The funny thing is, when you're not doing God's work, you're probably doing somebody else's. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own livings. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. As he says, like, and as strong as, and, you know, for the love of God, get off your butt. That's what he's saying. I think of uh, the, the, the quote, the very, very biblical quote, the, the Mattis, the general Mattis quote. That I'm asking you with tears in my eyes, get up, go out, do work. I don't want to have to call in the rest of the... Because here's the thing. The lazy people are a risk, are a problem for the church as a whole and for themselves as an individual, as individuals. And this is true, not only in the church, we can look at it, this is true elsewhere. Um, he's going to give this uh, further warning. He says, take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so that they will be ashamed. Wait, Paul wants some believers to be ashamed? Sometimes. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. He's taking, the, he's taking one of the strongest warnings. This is, at all, this is as close to excommunication as Paul is going to get in this letter. He gets to excommunication in another letter, but, but this one, he's like, hey, listen, because it's that bad. We, we just think of them as dead weight. Paul doesn't think of them as dead weight. He thinks of them as even worse than dead weight. He thinks of them at almost to the point of excommunication. That's big. When we look in the world, uh, maybe you've, you've seen this before, where somebody's been really excited, maybe uh, um, we've got a few veterans in here. You know in the military, when you, you come in the military, and then you, then you go through boot camp, you're all excited, you get out there, and you're like, oh, I'm so excited. And everybody's like, settle down, settle down. And it's just how it works. Or the new kid on the job, I'm so happy I'm a firefighter. We're going to fly there. And every fire, and all the other firefighters, come on, sit down. Somebody gets really excited. I really love this. I think we can change the world. It happens also in the church. Boy, it doesn't happen in the church. Somebody gets sold out for Jesus. They're like, I think I'm going to be a missionary. And they're like, yeah, this set your sights a little lower. Like, just come over here and sit next to me. You don't have to be all silly. Yeah, you do. You have to be silly. You have to be sold out. You have to be moving forward. I will tell you this, that what he is saying is he's saying that laziness is contagious. Don't hang out with lazy people. The good news is, on the other side, is that, uh, that people that are zealous for Christ, that's contagious too. I heard people say this. Now, this is all, all the... Uh, it's, all, it's told in an interesting way, grammatically, so forgive me, but I'm going to throw it out there. I, somebody said, if you do not want to be a missionary... Do not read stories about missionaries. Yes, Ricky? What's a zealot? Ooh, very good. Thank you for asking. Uh, uh, zeal means to have a lot of passion or excitement. So we use it now to be somebody that is super, uh, super excited about something. Yeah. It actually comes from, from the biblical period about a bunch of terrorists, to tell you the truth that were so sold out for God that they were murdering people. We're not talking about that kind of self. But we are saying to be zealous, to be passionate for God, that's important. Good, good question. And then he closes, and I'll, I'll close the letter with this. Uh, I'll close today, kind of wrapping this up here, where he says, Now, uh, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every situation. It's interesting 
to remember what this, this letter was written to people that were uh, troubled. They were troubled because they were going through persecution. They were doing all this. And he is, Paul right here is identifying identifying himself as an agent of peace. Since the Lord be with you, uh, be with uh, you all. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. I do this in all my letters to prove that they are from me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So he ends right here, uh, again, reminding everybody that he is an agent and a, and, a, and a blesser, if you will, providing this blessing of peace. But i got to put it out. So there were people that were, that were in turmoil. They were confused. They were afraid. Paul's letter comes in as a voice from the Prince of Peace, and it comes in, and his letter is very confrontational. So we've got to understand that in, in the Bible, when, when Jesus is talking about uh, peace, he is not meaning the, the absence of action. So like, we will look at a lake, and the water will be still, and we'll say, that is a peaceful lake. That is not right. That is not this kind of sense. Peace isn't the absence of violence. There's more to it in a biblical sense. It's bigger than this. For example, if the U.S. surrendered to the Nazis during World War II, that would have given you peace in the sense of nobody, no belligerents. But that would not have been the same outcome as the Nazis surrendering to the U.S. Make sense? Yes. What happened to all the Nazis? What happened to all the Nazis? Yes. Uh, a few of them were killed. A few? Only a few. Uh, most of the rest of them ended up living other lives. Being somebody's grandpa or grandma, great grandma. Um, the idea that, that we looked at was when we fought the Second World War was very similar to this Christian idea that our, our goal was to destroy an ideology, not a people. So destroying the, the organization that was the Nazism was, was preferable to taking everybody that ever claimed to be Nazis and setting fire to them. Comes from a it's a that comes from a uh, uh, Christian heritage. That's not a. That's not how the world normally rolls, by the way. But it comes back to the from the same source of our idea. The idea is we're not battling the prophets of Baal. We're trying to rescue the prophets of Baal. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to rescue them from Baal. When we look here, he's reminding us that to be that agent of peace, we have to be in the fight. Very interesting, because in the biblical sense, to be at peace means to be not only uh, not a threat to your neighbors that way, but to be in a position of right relationship with God. That only that peace in that sense has to include justice. It all has to be. It has to be that way. It's not just one side laid down their arms. As a matter of fact, now you see that when he's saying that these people that are, are feeling uh, the lack of comfort, what he's saying is he's saying, get back to the mission and get out there. Now the truth is this. We as Christians, we as believers, are not supposed to seek to do harm to other human beings. That's not part of our role. But we are dangerous. We are dangerous to ideologies. We are dangerous to worldviews. And we are supposed to stay dangerous to those ideologies and worldviews. And we're supposed to be, if we want the peace to come to, if we really love our fellow man, we want to lean into that and rescue our fellow man. Because back to that earlier picture, we're on the battlefield trying to save as many lives that are there as we can. So it comes back and wraps it all up here. So peace with God is not inaction. 
It's about transformation. Because the word comes in, transforms us, transforms our actions, and we move out into the world and we do stuff. The healthy believers aren't, aren't, there's no such thing as a healthy believer that's merely a recipient of ministry. That as soon as you, whatever you receive, you give. Whatever you learn, you teach. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how whatever. I, you know, the kids coming in here, a lot of kids, I'm sorry. He said, well, you know, some, sometimes they want to be called little people or little adults or little grown-ups or whatever. <laughs> they don't want to be called teenagers yet, but then once they want to be called teenagers, then they don't want to be called anything else. But here's the deal. So you may think that when you come in and you listen to the service, maybe there's some things I say that I don't say that I don't understand. I hope like Ricky you ask the questions. What does that mean? And then you learn those things. But whatever you get, whatever knowledge you have, you share with the playground. Or, uh, wherever. <laughs> and sometimes it's, it's merely, it may be something simple. It may be something as simple as seeing somebody that's having a bad day and going over and talking to them. See, again, back to why I feel so bad for the enemy. Is that all of his plans can be messed up by some knucklehead having sharing a coffee with somebody in a Starbucks. I mean, think about that. Spends decades of all, uh, to try, trying to create this person quite fit for hell, and then some knucklehead uh, goes out and has a coffee with them and talks to them about Jesus and upsets all of that. <laughs> Healthy believers are active out there doing the Lord's ministries, wherever you're at. And addition, uh, so uh, ministry may not be without risk, but the reality is if we want comfort, if we want peace, it's found in the action of being involved. Uh, furthermore, he suggests that laziness is something that's shameful and contagious, and we should identify it as such. It's not harmless to have just people that are just, oh, they're just dead weight. Dead weight isn't harmless. It's not harmless to them. That we need to continue to, to say, hey guys, get up, get up, get by the love, I'm asking you with tears in my eyes. We need to get up and go because it's good for them. It's good for us. It's good for the people out there. And lastly, that's what it leads to lastly, is we all need to get up and go. All of us, get up and go. It's not, it's not some sacred small group of people that these people are called to, to the gospel ministry. That's the whole idea, is that we are all called to the gospel ministry. I, I, always, I always wondered that when they were like, when I got ordained as a pastor, or licensed as a pastor, it's like licensed to the gospel ministry, called to the gospel ministry. And I'm like, how is this different from when Jesus called me and said, follow me? Yeah. I will say as a teacher that I'm more accountable. That I have to, when I, on judgment day, I don't only have to answer for my spiritual growth, I actually have to answer for all your spiritual growth. All your spiritual growth. All of your spiritual growing? That's better than talking about growths. But that's true. But we all have that. We all have some responsibility to go forward and do this. So as we're going out there, I'm going to close in prayer. And I really want us to just kind of see that that mission and, and that tank, that ability to do these things, that ability to resist the whatever we think is a mighty power here is actually found through Christ in us through the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit here. And it's our mission. God didn't abandon us here on this earth. He left us here with a mission. And I, I'm... I, uh, I almost... Well, I'll say it. The reason that Jesus did not come back today, yet, or yet, or yesterday, or else yesterday, is because God has faith in us. He believes that we are going to advance the gospel today. And as long as he believes we're going to advance the gospel, he'll wait. I think that's beautiful. Let's go Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you did not abandon us and leave us. That what you did is you put us here on purpose, in place on purpose, 
that we saw with Jesus' prayer, that this was his prayer, was that we would be empowered here to continue his mission of saving the lost. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that. That because of that, because we're the kingdom of, of God, because we are his kingdom here on earth, that we have the power to overturn worldviews. And that's what we ask. Well, we ask the wisdom and, 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 the, uh, and the courage to go forward, even at personal temporal risk, that we can go forward and we continue today that we see lives given to you, that we continue to steal people from the enemy, that we continue to rescue from the battlefield those people who have lived lives as prophets of Baal, or prophets of Satan, and we turn around and we upset the apple cart through the power of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit uh, moving in this world. Lord, we ask that we go out here uh, not afraid or timid of some antichrist or some uh, world power or some hand behind the, the corner of this thing, but we recognize that as, as we rely on your word and we rely on your Holy Spirit and we rely on the body of Christ, that we are the thing that the enemy is afraid of. Help us go out and, and make it right for him to be afraid of us. Help us execute the power that you've given us and the mission you've given us in a way that brings glory to heaven, that shakes the pillars of hell. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. I'm going to send you out with a blessing. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, that he makes his face shine upon you, that he's gracious to you, and he grants you peace. Amen.